Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and in this video we're going to be talking about hot start problems more specifically on older vehicles with carburetors and electronic or non-electronic ignitions. You, you most likely have come across this problem. You start up your car when it's cold and it cranks up beautifully. You drive away with it, you have your ride and then all of a sudden you have to fill up the car or you want to get some coffee. You do this kind of pit stop, you turn off the engine, you get your coffee or you fill up the tank and then you get back in the car happily with your coffee cup in your hand. You, know, you try to start the car and guess what? The bloody thing doesn't start. So now you're stuck. You have to wait a while. You zip your coffee until it's empty and then you try again and all of a sudden the car is starting again and you drive happily away. A common problem caused by heat. And this video is trying to address all the possible causes for that kind of an issue. And I had exactly that problem and I've been working on it for two days to find the actual cause. And that's why I decided to make this video. And now we do have a problem. And the only thing you can do right now is enjoy your coffee until the engine is cold and then start again. Of course, we're not going to sit there and sip our coffee. Uh, we need to find the cause of the problem. But one thing we can say already is that the cause is heat. It could have an effect on the ignition and it could have an effect on the fuel system. So let's start with the fuel system. If the fuel system is the cause of the problem, then there's only two reasons. Either the engine is flooded or the engine is suffering from starvation of fuel. Now I will be looking at a carburetor type because that's what most of our older vehicles have. And the fuel that we used to have in the old days was quite different than the fuel we have today. Today we have a lot of additives, so that has changed the characteristics of the fuel. Now the fuel is going to evaporate faster than what it did before, and that's why we may have a problem with what we call vapor lock, a very well-known term amongst many people and being used many times for problems and often it really isn't vapor lock. But what is vapor lock? Now vapor lock is nothing more than the creation of gas bubbles emitted from the gas itself inside the fuel lines and that is typically caused by heat. Now the old fuels didn't have this issue but modern fuels as I said before are having additives to it and it makes it more um, lighter. It, the boiling point is lower so we're going to have more gases being created at lower temperatures with modern fuels. So you'll see that you're going to get air bubbles in the fuel lines here and these air bubbles are going to start blocking the fuel supply to the carburetor. Now what can you do about this to prevent this? Well there's a couple of things you can do. First of all do not use metal fuel lines. That's the first thing I would say and try to use rubber types. That will avoid a lot of heat transfer compared to steel types or copper types. The second thing is that you might want to go for a electrical fuel pump located near to the gas tank and not a mechanical one located on the engine block because on the engine that fuel pump will collect heat and if you're turning off the engine the heat will still rise for a while and then it will drop down. So these are the main things you can prevent uh, vapor lock. So run all your fuel lines away from heat sources. Try to do it with a rubber hose specifically designed for fuel lines and also try to have a return to the fuel tank so you keep circling that fuel from the fuel tank all the way to the carburetor and back. Now most cars have a single line system but there you can actually fix issues quite easily with installing an electrical pump near to the gas tank and even with a single line that will work properly. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration of what vapor lock is and I have a tube here with fuel inside and I'm going to heat it up a little bit and you will see that you, all little bubbles that will start to appear uh, vapor of the fuel. Uh, but first of all let's check the temperature that we have for the moment. 20 degrees centigrade. So let's heat it up and see what happens. I don't want to make it cook of course and I will check the temperature once we are at the right temperature but it takes a bit of time because this is a fairly large tube. So if you look closely you can actually see the bubbles being generated and this is exactly what happens in your fuel system when you have vapor lock. I'm going to take the heat on this just to show you and it's around 45 degrees centigrade. Now you know that an engine typically runs around 70 so you can see this is happening very early and very quickly. 
you have seen that these gas bubbles are generated very quickly even on low temperatures. It started at around 45 to 50 but around 75 degrees centigrade it was quite violently. So if you have hoses uh, that are bent in one or another way this gas will travel up the bend because gas always gets to the highest point and it's going to form right here on the top a lock, a vapor lock as we call it. So I call it gas, gas bubbles but actually they are vapor bubbles and they were going to be sitting right here on the top and fuel can no longer pass so your engine will be suffering from fuel starvation. However fuel starvation is not the only problem with heat. The engine can also suffer from fuel flooding. So once you stop the engine, it's going to have a certain temperature, right? A running temperature, let's say around 75 to 80 degrees centigrade. Of course, when you stop the engine, that cooling circuitry will stop, right? It, you won't have no more cooling. The ventilator stops and the water pump has stopped. So heat will build up in the engine and that heat will transfer through the intake manifold into the carburetor. And that's what we call heat percolation. Now, when heat percolation happens, then your carburetor is going to get real hot and when the carburetor gets hot fuel in the fuel chamber will expand and that could cause flooding through the emulsion tubes or to the jets it can cause all kind of issues so that's another thing we need to prevent now, of course the first thing you need to do is to make sure that your carburetor has the proper float level so adjust your float level to where it be because the float level determines the height of the fuel in the emulsion tube and in the flow chamber. So if the float level is too high, you may have exactly the same problem. And it might be that due to the heat, the fuel is expanding and then it's gonna leak out through the jets. So make sure that the float level is right. And the fuel pressure is as critical as actually your float level. Make sure that you have applied the right fuel pressure to your carburetor. So setting the right fuel pressure for your carburetor is very important. So I always recommend to install a fuel pressure regulator to combine it with a filter and adjust to the right pressure for your specific carburetor. I'm using about three to four and a half PSI on my Edelbrock but of course that will be different for different carburetors and you need to find out because that pressure will also affect the float level uh, in your carburetor fuel chamber. If heat percolation is a problem on the vehicle then you can install a spacer which is going to insulate the intake manifold from the carburetor and they exist in wood but they also special spacers that are provided by your carburetor uh, producer. I'm, I'm using a spacer from Edelbrock which is about a centimeter thick which is going to insulate the heat from my intake manifold to my carburetor. And that is not an aluminum one, it is a special material that insulates heat very well. Anyway, but before you do so, make sure that your fuel lines are sorted out, make sure that your float level is good, make sure that you have the right pressure on your carburetor. And if you can, fit an electrical fuel pump away from the engine. So on this engine, we have fitted the performer intake manifold and it sits straight onto the block of the engine. So that's going to get a lot of heat from the engine. And the carburetor, what I'm having installed is an Edelbrock CMF 500, but it doesn't really matter. And what you can see is that I have like a centimeter thick spacer here, this black part. That is a special spacer I bought from Edelbrock to insulate the heat from the intake manifold percolating into the carburetor. And that makes a difference. So let's do some measurements. So I'm going to measure the temperature on the intake manifold and what I measure is around 50 degrees centigrade. If I measure it on the carburetor on the flow chamber, I have around 36 degrees centigrade. So we looked at the fuel system and we tried to fix all the issues on the fuel system and I've applied all those measures on this vehicle. And guess what? My next stop at the gas station, same problem. So now it was time to investigate on the ignition system. Now what can be wrong on the ignition system? Well, typically spark plugs could be polluted and they may create an arc between the electrode and actually the insulation because of the coating of carbon on it. But that is normally not the problem. Um, of course, you have to fit the right spark plugs in it. So for the right temperature, the hot or the cold ones, depending on the performance on your engine. I might do a separate video one day on spark plugs themselves. But consider that the spark plugs are okay. Consider that all your uh, high tension leads are okay. There could still be a problem with your distributor, with your electronic components of the ignition system and your ignition coil. 
These are the three possible areas where you could have a problem. So imagine that this is your ignition coil fitted into the engine and of course you're going to have your high tension lead coming off and a lot of other wires going to your distributor and the plus 12 volts. So all what you need to do really is to heat that up while the engine is cold, the engine is running and it's still cold, warm up that ignition coil, you know, and then see what the engine does. Once it's warmed up to about 75 degrees or 80 degrees centigrade, turn off the engine and try to start it. If it doesn't start, you have a bad ignition coil. Another quick check you can do in the ignition coil is to disconnect all the cables and then measure with an ohm meter set to a very low scale and I've set it to 200 ohms. And then put the two pins together of your ohm meter, see what the loss is in your leads and I have like 0.3 and then actually measure the impedance across the plus and the minus of the ignition coil. Now that typically should be more than 1.2 and here I have actually 2.6. So actually I have 2.3 considering um, the loss of my own cables. So this is good. Uh, this is another thing you can do and you can heat it up meanwhile and see if this is going to change. If you have a spare ignition coil it doesn't hurt to change it out and I changed mine out very quickly and make sure that you have the right ignition coil for your engine because some require a ballast resistor in front and others don't. So don't forget that part because that can cause also issues. Now uh, the next step is of course the distributor and we're going to be looking at my specific distributor but it's applicable to all distributors because they all have common parts. So let's have a look on that distributor. So now we can look on the distributor what the possible causes could be. Uh, I've taken one off the shelf here because it's easier to show it to you than in car. Now this happens to be a Lucas 35 DLM8 but it doesn't really matter um, because all distributors are more or less the same and I'm now referring to more older cars. I'm not talking about brand new cars. That's quite different and it doesn't really matter if it's a four or an eight or a six cylinder. So the first thing is we're going to take off the cap and you can do this with clips or with screws, whatever it is. So let's take the cap off. Make sure that you have a proper cap, that all the contacts inside are clean. This one is not. This is an old cap, but make sure that it's really good and that the carbon tip there is still intact and spring loaded. Very important. And then check that the rotor is good. Um, this rotor is an old one, not very good as you can see. I've seen issues with uh, distributors that get hot where the rotor is actually starting to leak because of carbon buildup between the core here and actually the metal part in the back. And then the, the high tension voltage that is supposed to go to the spark plug uh, this way over this copper uh, conductor here is actually not going that way. It actually is jumping over to that part inside here and then to the ground and you get very poor spark. So it's always good to make sure that your distributor is in a good condition and then replace it. You know, it's like a two euro, two dollar piece. So it's cheap. Don't take risks. All right, let's put that aside. And now we are back down to the actual distributor itself. Um, if you have a breaker point based distributor, check the condensator on the side that might be shorted. But this is an electronic version with an electronic pickup. Now inside uh, you have a moving part and then you have a coil that picks up the signal and on the side uh, we have an amplifier. And we'll get in more detail into this in a few minutes. Now the amplifier itself is on this one mounted onto the distributor. In other applications you will find the amplifier away from the distributor. Now this specific distributor, the 35 DLM8 from Lucas and similar, similar distributors have an issue. Uh, when the engine is hot, heat comes through the body of the distributor and the amplifier, which is sitting right here, um, which is actually amplifying the pulses getting from the induction system and then with those leads allows current to flow through the coil or not is getting very hot and this is built with solid state devices and I will open it for you so you can see it. When this is getting hot uh, it tends to break down or it changes the parameters on how it behaves and that's why you get bad starting conditions. In my specific case on the car I was working on I have changed the uh, amplifier here from a aftermarket part to the original Lucas part and believe me, it made day and I different and it fixed my problem. So, uh, you could have a problem with your pickup points, which is very unlikely. Or you could have a problem with your amplifier. 
And the best way to check this is if you have an oscilloscope or you go and buy immediately a replacement uh, amplifier, but buy an original one. Don't buy an aftermarket one because they are crap, believe me. I've tried three of them, they were all three crap, and this is a crappy one. And the reason that this car had a problem with hot starting was a faulty ignition amplifier. It would work fine when it was cold, although on higher revs you could hear misfiring every so often. But when the engine was hot, the components inside were really hot as well of that ignition amplifier and it changed completely the behavior. It actually moved the timing completely off and that's why I couldn't get it started. So I replaced this aftermarket part with a original genuine part from Lucas and my problem was solved. Now, I know there are solutions to extend this amplifier on this specific distributor to what your bulk had with a wire or a cable, you can do that if you want to. I probably might do that over time, I'll see how this goes. Uh, but now if you're more interested in how this 35 DLM8 distributor works, or in general on how electronic distributors work, stay tuned because I'm going to take it to my little workshop where we're going to hook it up to the scope and a signal generator and we're going to have a look on how this is working. If you're not interested in this, I hope you enjoyed this video and you can skip out. In fact, you can always skip out whenever you want. But if you do enjoy it and you want to watch further, well, bear with me. So let's go. I have the distributor on the workbench and what you can see inside is a pickup coil, which is magnetic. Underneath here, you have a magnetic strip. And then the middle part is the part that will rotate. And then on the side, you have the amplifier. When the engine is running, you'll see that the middle part will be rotating. And you see all these wings here. And I have eight wings on this because I have an eight cylinder. If you have a four cylinder, you will have four wings. And each of those wings represents a cylinder and a pulse. So while this is rotating, it's going to pass this pickup coil here, which is magnetized. There's a magnet underneath here. You can probably see that my screwdriver is hanging on it. And then it will change the magnetic field because it's passing. And because of that, it's going to rate a very faint pulse. And that pulse is fed over those two wires to your amplifier. Now that pulse is not strong enough to generate power through the ignition coil. Let me take this apart so we can have a bit of a better look. So the parts on the distributor are very simple. We've got the distributor itself with all the bulb weights inside. Underneath here, the vacuum and the van system. And then this uh, tooth wheel here where we find the wings, one for each cylinder that's going to rotate while the engine is running. We have the pickup um, system, which is a pickup coil. This is not your ignition coil. That's the one which is magnetized, as you can see. Oops. And this connects with two leads towards the amplifier. And this is the amplifier, and it will connect to those two pins. Now, the signal coming out of this pickup point is very, very weak. So it needs to be uh, modified, amplified, and then it can drive a switch or a transistor to drive the current through the ignition coil. And the ignition coil is driven through those two outer pins. In fact, it's a negative side going to the ignition coil. The other pin is actually a plus 12 volts pin for feeding the ampl uh, amplifier module. Now the amplifier module is fitted onto the housing through this bracket here. And you see the white stuff? If you're ever gonna install a module like this, <laughs> that'd be to remove my screwdriver, uh, you're gonna need something uh, like this. This is heatsink paste. So this is a special compound that allows heat to be transferred from the, this uh, amplifier onto the body of the actual distributor for cooling purposes. You actually see that on the back here, if you look at this, you see these little vents here. This will aid to the cooling. Um, but in my case, it didn't help too much, as you've seen. So now let's put this together a little bit and we're going to do a few tests with the oscilloscope. Then we're going to hook it up and warm it up again and I'll use an ignition coil to show you what the effect is when it warms up. So I've hooked up the oscilloscope to the distributor and more specifically to the output of the pickup point. If I'm now going to rotate the distributor, we should see pulses coming up for every wing on the distributor. So let me try to run this. Um, 
Of course, I'm spinning it by hand, so it's not very steady, so you're not gonna see evenly distributed pulses. All right, so I captured that. So these are the pulses that we now picked up. These are the pulses that the picker point picked up from the distributor, and each of these pulses or peaks reflects the wing passing by that coil inside the distributor. And this will drive the ignition coil, but of course this is not long enough in time, it is not powerful enough in time, so this shape has to be reworked, the bottom part has to be cut off, so we want to end up on the square wave. And that's the whole purpose of the amplifier that we have on the distributor. So now let's hook up the amplifier and see what happens. I have rigged up the distributor as it would be in the car with the power supply in the back, a high tension coil and a spark plug. And if I'm now going to rotate the distributor, the pulses will be picked up right there on the pickup point. They will be amplified by the amplifier. Current will be driven through the coil and the secondary winding will pick that up of the high, high tension coil and it will actually spark the spark plug. So let's see. So I'm going to turn it and hopefully you can see it and I'm going to give you a bit of a close up on the spark plug itself. And I can see the sparks going back and forth. I reconnected the scope so you can actually see the pulses that are coming out of the ignition amplifier. They will be quite different than what we saw at the input. So let me try to capture this for you. The trace on the scope shows the output of the ignition amplifier. And whenever it's low, we have current flowing through the ignition coil. This is what we call actually the dwell angle. Now that there is a variation, that's me actually rotating the uh, distributor not equally because I do it by hand. And when the pulse is high, then we have the plus 12 volts and then there's no current flowing through the ignition coil. Um, so that's the moment in time we actually are getting the sparks, so when the peak is up. So always a spark is generated when the current is dropped on the coil. So this is going to be the last test we're going to do on this amplifier module. I have it rigged all back up, I have the module, I took away the distributor, so I'm feeding in a signal which is normally would be the same as what comes out of the pickup points into the amplifier module. And then I'm having a spark plug on the other side, so the amplifier module is driving the high tension coil and we have a spark plug also there. So it just, the sparks are going right now and here I can actually see on the scope um, what the pulse is on the actual high tension coil on the low side. So um, now I'm ro running on a very low frequency, but if I would throttle up the engine, with, with, which, which means increasing the uh, frequency, then you should see that picking up very quickly, see? So then these pulses are getting much closer to each other, so. So now you can see the sparks on the spark plug and if I reduce the frequency or the RPMs on the engine, you'll see these sparks are going to get less in period, right? So it's going to get lower and lower. And this is how the ignition system works. So now we could actually increase the temperature on the module and see what happens with it. The sparks stopped and that's just because I have removed initially the output of the pickup coil. And I, if I put it back up, like I would start the engine now from warm, because now this module is really warm, it doesn't work anymore. I don't get sparks and that's exactly the problem we are having. See now it's coming little bit by little bit, but it's not working. So I'm going to measure the temperature on the actual module itself and it's not all that hot to be very honest. It runs around 40 degrees centigrade and it has already crapped out on me. So, so folks we're nearing the end of this video and all I can say is if you're going to replace the ignition amplifier on your Lucas distributor or any other distributor because it's acting up when it's getting warm or at high RPMs then um, don't replace it with a aftermarket part. And let me turn this off because it's a bit of noise and let me also turn off the engine. 
uh, because these aftermarket parts are not that good. Uh, they suffer from erratic uh, behavior at high temperatures or higher temperatures and in high RPMs. So try to go with the genuine original part. Um, there's a huge price difference uh, between them. The Lucas ones is quite expensive. It's about five times or six times the cost of an aftermarket one, but we know why. So, um, I might still want to show you the inside of it so you can have a peek what it is. There's not much to be seen inside, it's just some electronic circuitry. Because this module is doing more than just amplifying the pulse, it is also adjusting the dwell angle uh, depending on um, the um, RPMs the engine is making. So, if you're running on high RPMs, um, the dwell angle is staying the same normally, but the time it takes to pass these amount of uh, degrees is less, so the current through the ignition coil is less, and in that case um, you don't charge up the coil enough with electromagnetic fields, so the spark is going to be weak. So what these modules do as well is they actually reduce the dwell angle, so they make the dwell angle, dwell angle a bit uh, longer so that you have more time to charge up the ignition coil um, at high RPMs. Anyway, we can talk a lot about this, but I don't think that's the, the purpose. So I hope you enjoyed this video a bit, as much as I did, and I'll see you in my next one, which is going to be a little bit more hands-on mechanical. Thank you for viewing.